Well, I want to begin the sermon on the principles with a quotation from a liberal theologian named Anthony Padovano. Being human is the most difficult and the most religious of all our undertakings. For being human means accepting the sacredness and fragility of one's own life. It means living every moment with tragedy at hand and grace close by. Being human means forever trying to settle oneself into unsettling situations in life. It means accepting the freedom and unknowability of the human enterprise. It means that anything can happen to us. We can gain the world and lose God or forfeit life and find love. Being human means reaching for the stars and the person next to us at the same time. And it also means missing the stars and the person nearby. Being human is the most difficult and the most religious of our undertakings. For being human means accepting the sacredness and fragility of one's own life. End quote. There is an awful lot at stake in this being alive thing. After all, no matter what your beliefs, we are only certain of getting one crack at this life. Now, happily, we can get lots of chances to start again over the course of that life, but ultimately, we have to define what ours is going to look like. If it is to have meaning, well, we're the ones who are going to have to define what meaning is and then make it for ourselves. So, no, this is not a sermon about be all you can be or achieve some greatness in your living. That stuff is overrated. Success, while nice, is given far too much prominence in our culture because success does not automatically equate to either happiness or a satisfying life. No, I'd rather talk about living a life you can stand. About making choices that allow you to sleep at night. About savoring the simple happinesses you find every day. I want to talk about satisfaction and contentment. I would rather talk about facing your daily struggles and occasional life crises with character and a sense of dignity. I would rather talk about coming to the end of each day, whether it was a good one or a terrible one, and being able to say that you have done everything you could with what you had. You are enough. If there's been a focus for my career as a minister, it has been preaching that message. You are enough. And then I follow it up with celebrating the value of people forming communities of mutual support, be they communities of two or two hundred. Respecting and supporting the growth and struggle of individuals is the major task of religion, though that very basic duty has often been lost in the swirl of institution building and the quest for power. Indeed, while discussions about the existence of deities and how best they might be worshipped is important, it's almost a distraction of the real work of serving the people who need to figure out how to get through their days and nights. Religion should be helping us make it through those times, helping us find the tools we need to live well and the reassurances that such living is indeed possible by you. And a rich spiritual and moral life can be had simply by being encouraged to figure it out for yourself, not by dictating the proper way to be spiritual, the proper moral positions to hold, the proper way to bound down. To have any meaningful impact in our lives, those are the kinds of things we've got to work out for ourselves and not adopt unquestioningly. Religious leaders must respect the people, the people they lead, 
and not expect them to be docile sheep. Religion cannot hand you morality or spirituality. It can't give you meaning by itself. It needs you because such things emerge naturally from people who set their minds and their hearts towards trying to lead good lives. At its best, religion can only suggest pathways, offer tools to help you along the way. And maybe religion can legitimately encourage discussions without dictating the final answer. Unitarianism tries to do that. But when religions try to control conversations and shut down questions, that's when they begin to lose their way. And Unitarianism tries very hard to avoid that trap. Despite all the priests and the imams and the rabbis and the pastors and the gurus, the work of religion is yours to do. Not me, it's yours to do. As Padovano says, being human is the most difficult and the most religious of our undertakings, for being human means accepting the sacredness and fragility of our own life. And only you can do that. The only religion, really, is personal religion. The religion inside of you. Religion is an impulse, I believe, that's buried deeply inside the human psyche, the human heart, the human soul, whichever you prefer. It is a drive to find or create stories that explain the mysteries of life. It is what we use to make sense of the things we cannot understand, how we tie it all together. And that's what the Latin root of the word religion means. It's a verb that means tie together or bind up. Now, you may choose to use the word religious or not. That's fine. It's a word that works for me. But the work of making moral sense of your word stems from that impulse inside of you, however you choose to call it. Each of us makes the decisions about which stories are going to be the most impactful on our worldview. Some of us will choose stories that are science and fact-based. Others, stories that are more romantic. Some stories are shaped by myth or the natural world or deeply seated emotional impulses. Some stories are there because we want them to be true. Some are given to us by parents and honored elders. The stories that shape that worldview are the ones that strike the chord in our deepest beings. Only you get to say which ones matter most to you. Sadly, sometimes we find ourselves keeping those most significant stories buried. We have to pretend that our stories don't really matter while trying to fit in by using other people's more acceptable stories, stories that have been forced upon us. Look at the damage done to women, to LGBTQ2 people, to the enslaved and the oppressed of all kinds who were forced to live with their own stories hidden. To me, that's a definition of misery and frustration. We need to live by our own stories, and that's why I chose to become a Unitarian about 40 years ago. I found in this community a place where my personal religion was accepted and honored by others who only asked that I respect and honor theirs. That seemed like a pretty good deal. Still does. I don't believe religion is about saving souls in some other life. Again, I say that the job of religion, especially Unitarian Universalism, is about getting through this life with a sense of worth and dignity, with a belief that we have lived well and made the best moral and ethical choices we could at the time. Unitarianism and Universalism both were religions born in the Protestant Reformation. They were founded by people who were rejecting the stories that they were being ordered to believe and ordered to practice. It's no different today, except that fewer new arrivals in our communities come burdened with old dogmas. 
Today we find more people who are simply trying to learn what religion is for the first time and then are willing to do their own spiritual and moral work. But one way to describe 500 years of our history could be as a journey out from under the weight of doctrine and a rejection of the single, one-size-fits-all religious story. Using the tools of rationalism and tolerance, combining them with a passion for freedom and religious thought, Unitarians and Universalists moved increasingly to a theology of the individual. It was a, a humanistic theology that suggested, and this was radical and scary at the time, suggested that we actually, we human beings, we simple individual creatures have the abilities and the skills and the moral capacity to make our own difficult decisions. We were not the puppets of some divinity who were idly waiting for that divinity to decide our fates. Now, for some of us, a divinity still has a place in our stories, and for others, not so much. Some build their personal views on the structures of Christianity. Others choose different foundations. That's okay. It is we who get to decide our beliefs in this church. It is we who decide whether we believe in heaven or hell. It is we who get to make the thousand moral decisions that still exist within the larger boundaries of social norms. There was a Unitarian Universalist advertising slogan about 20 years ago that I've always rather liked. The banner read, Unitarian Universalism, a religion that puts its faith in you. Now, two challenges to Unitarianism have typically arisen from all of this independence and humanism. First, it's been chronically hard to define what a Unitarian is. Second, it can be a challenge to build a sense of community when there is such a great diversity of opinion. Now, I'm going to deal with this second point in a subsequent service in this, in this month when I discuss vision. So, back to that first question of what the heck is a Unitarian anyway? Our critics have often accused us of believing in anything and standing for nothing. It's a criticism that comes from a position that a creed has to be believed and followed and certain rules must be accepted. It's a position, in my view, that lacks respect for the people and loses sight of the basic job that religion is supposed to serve us and not the other way around. And in fact, the statement that we don't believe in anything is simply not true. We're all believers. We just don't all believe the same things. Nor does our religion require us to believe the same things. As one of our earliest Transylvanian Unitarian ministers proclaimed, we need not think alike to love alike. Still, back in the 1980s, when I was just becoming involved in the church, there was a push to develop a new statement that spoke to who we are, that gave us some sense of identity. Would it be possible to find some ideas, some phrases that would adequately describe us? A commission was struck to find out, and the process of discussion and consultation took five years. It involved, by invitation, every congregation and every individual who wished to participate. Broad ideas and then draft statements were debated and voted upon in congregations and small communities and then in large delegate assemblies. It was truly a democratic process. And the statement of principles we read in that responsive reading was the result, along with the statement of five key sources for our beliefs, now six, and I'll speak about the sources next week. The principles were a cleverly and creatively sensitive document. If you look at them again, you'll see they are not statements of belief. They are not doctrines that must be followed. At best, they're guidelines. We each have to make judgments and decisions every day about people we meet, situations we encounter, news stories we read, and so on. And how we respond to all of that 
is a matter of character. Your character. And the principles offer us areas to consider as we start to make those decisions. Are my ideas respectful of the worth and dignity of other people? Even when I cannot understand their sometimes troubling and horrible acts? Even when I encounter someone who seems so different from me in social status or race or religion or life experience, etc.? Are my actions just and compassionate? Do I give others proper space to express their religious views, even if they're different from mine? And these days, a reasonable question to ask is when, if ever, is it appropriate to limit religious belief or practice that challenges the generally accepted views of society? That is a hard one. Our UU principles are not rules, nor are they faith statements. But the way we approach them define us as religious and moral people. They also define our congregations as communities of individuals who choose to journey together guided by some core ideas as we work on our personal religion. And that's the job, isn't it? because being human is the most difficult and the most religious of all our undertakings. For being human means accepting the sacredness and the fragility of one's own life. Amen. Words by Greta Crosby, a retired colleague. If I could give you one key and one key only to a more abundant life, I would give you a sense of your own worth, an unshakable sense of your own dignity as one grounded in the source of the cosmic dance, as one who plays a unique part in the unfolding story of the world. When you and I look at these trees, these flowers, anything at all, we are the universe looking at its handiwork. You have perhaps seen the pattern of cross and yarn called the Eye of God made first in the American Southwest in homage to the sun. We too, all of us together, all the eyes of all the creatures are the Eye of God. That's why we need each other. Our many ways of seeing that together we may rejoice and see clearly and find the many keys to abundant life. Once we are sure of our own innate worth, something that cannot be taken from us, we no longer need to prove it in the elaborate ways so often damaging to others and to ourselves. Once secure in our own dignity, we no longer need someone to hurt, whole classes of people to despise. Secure in the sense of our own worth, we can rejoice in the worth of others and love out of fullness instead of inner emptiness that eats others alive. So let us affirm one another as unique and irreplaceable persons.